Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, where I work, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod. To find out about future webinars, you can visit our Woods Hole Sea Grant education page or just follow us on Facebook. This, believe it or not, is the 23rd webinar in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these months of school closures. Now, all of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, and that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Now, today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Jennifer Stock, who works at NOAA's Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary in Olima, California. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in studying seabirds and educating people about the health of the ocean, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Jennifer is coming to us from the land of the coastal Miwok and the southern Pomo peoples. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina. A few guidelines for those of you that haven't been with us before. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to hear the speaker. However, you see your question box. Some of you have already written where you're from. Please continue to write questions as we go through the talk. I'll be keeping track of those for Jennifer, and she will stop every now and then and answer a few. We may not get to all of your questions, but we'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. So enough of me talking at this point. I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer, and it will be all yours, Jennifer. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. And it's great to hear where everybody's from around the country. And I'm really excited to be part of this webinar series. And today, we're going to talk about winged ambassadors, these animals that are a part of the ocean ecosystem, but they don't live under the ocean. They live on top of the ocean and soar all around our world ocean, which is three quarters of our Earth's planet. And I find them to be fascinating animals. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of their amazing adaptations. And then we're gonna focus on what we have as a winged ambassador here in the North Pacific Ocean, the albatrosses, and tell you a little bit about them. So we'll have time for questions and I look forward to sharing this with you. So just a little bit about me. I work as the education and outreach coordinator for the Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary in California. And what that means is I get to teach people about the ocean through the lens of our National Marine Sanctuary here off the coast of California. I started out loving the ocean at a young age. I grew up on Long Island, New York, and spent time in the waters of the Long Island Sound and the Atlantic Ocean, and remember taking long walks on the beaches and looking at everything that washed up and noticing the tides and how exciting it was to find things that were really rare and just had a lifelong love of our coastal ecology early on and was able to build my career around that. So as part of my work, I sometimes meet with students, I teach teachers, I do talks, I do webinars. And one of the unique things I do is I host a monthly radio program on a community radio station out here about the ocean. It's called Ocean Currents. And so it's a way to stay engaged with a lot of different ocean topics. But one of the things that I really love about my job is because I get to work with so many different audiences and sometimes kids is I get to be a little silly sometimes and sometimes I get to wear fun hats like that teaching about the deep sea. So it's a pretty exciting job and I'm really pleased to share some of the work that we have been doing here at the sanctuary with you all today. So you heard about our National Marine Sanctuary System, a part of NOAA. And this is a map showing where all these National Marine Sanctuaries are. And I heard where some of you are from earlier, and I know some of you have joined since, and I'm curious if anyone could type in which National Marine Sanctuary, if you can see on this map, might you be closest to? If you can't read the sanctuary, just tell us the state that you're in. We'd just love to hear how, where you're all at. Okay, great question. And I have to say, while folks are weighing in what sanctuary they're closest to, how excited we are to have Jennifer here talking 
to us about the National Marine Sanctuary System. She's our first sanctuary speaker in the series, and we've been dying to get someone here, so we're so excited to have her. And I see that James says um, he's closest to Stellwagen Bank, as is Duncan and um, Aoife, and we also have Avery's uh, in Alaska. We have Martha's closest to the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Lisa is close to the, um, the oh, I went off of it, but she's closest to the Olympic Coast Marine Sanctuary. We have Kyle near the Flower Garden Bank Sanctuary. Mabel and Luke are near Mallows Bay. Uh, Anya's near the Monterey Bay and Cordell Bank, so she's in your area. And Beckett is also closest to the Monterey Bay. So we've got folks from all over that are really aware of their sanctuary because they're all giving me the sanctuary name. That's great. Well, really nice to hear that. And also, um, if you'd like, I'd like to encourage you to check out the other sanctuaries at our, our website. And that's a link that'll be after this talk. But each one of these has a unique story, a unique thing that they're protecting, either an ecosystem or maritime history. And they're all really exciting places to learn about. They're kind of like national parks, but a little different because they're in the ocean and in the Great Lakes. And for us here in California, there's a lot of marine productivity, a lot of ocean life that we are working to protect along with maritime history with four national marine sanctuaries here in California. So I'm here at Cordell Bank, which is just north of San Francisco. And we are a national marine sanctuary that's entirely offshore. And we have a, a sister sanctuary right next to us, the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, and just south of us, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So this whole stretch of coast was a place that people really thought, we really wanna protect these places because they're so valuable to both our livelihoods, but also to all the animals that live here. And so we all work together to help protect these places. Cordell Bank, if you take a look at this map, there's some really neat features along the seafloor. So we have this light blue area and that's a couple hundred feet. And then there's this round little thumbprint here and that's the Cordell Bank. And a bank is a rocky feature on the seafloor. Very much like Stellwagen Bank, which I forgot to mention, Stellwagen Bank and Cordell Bank were both discovered and mapped by the same person, the same surveyor, his name was Edward Cordell. So that's a little link we have between our two areas between Massachusetts and California. And then we also have the Bodega Canyon, which you can see right here, this little wormy place right here. And that's really cool deep sea habitat. And then all these neat fissures here. So the diversity of seafloor contours in combination with a really dynamic ocean system and productivity system due to a process called upwelling, those two things combine to make this amazing area where there's a ton of food in the water and we call this productivity. So we have krill on the right there that is this red mass of animals and those are little tiny euphousids which are tiny little shrimp and I actually have some here for you. I'm going to give you a quick close-up here. These are animals that are only about two centimeters wide and you see those little black dots those are their eyes and they need those eyes for seeing down in the deep because they go down deep at night. But this tiny little food is actually a really important food resource for a lot of animals, a lot of whales, a lot of seabirds and fish. We also, with all that food, have a lot of anchovies, a type of schooling fish and sardines and squid. And I love the squid, they're really fun because they have this great long body here with lots of little tentacles and this fleshy part here and they become a really good food, especially for the seabirds. So we have a ton of food in the water here, which is why animals come from all around the Pacific Ocean to feed here. We have whales coming up from Costa Rica and Mexico. We have seabirds traveling from Chile and New Zealand and all the way across from the Hawaiian Islands because the food is so good. So that is the main reason why we're working to protect these waters. So with all that food in the water, seabirds love Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary. These are just a, a snapshot of some of the birds that we've seen out there. And from all the research and studies that we've done, we've seen 71 different species of seabirds out in these waters. Knowing there's about 350 seabird species, that's quite a bit for um, one tiny little area of the ocean. So the food is really good. 
So it's an area we really wanna learn more about so we can best protect it to help support these animals. But seabirds are, to me, really a fascinating animal because they travel on top of the water. And if you've ever been at the ocean on a stormy day and it's windy and it's blustery, you can't imagine what it's like to be living on top of the water. So the adaptations of these animals are pretty awesome and we're gonna dive into those right now. So we're gonna talk about what is a seabird and think about all the adaptations these animals have for having a successful life on the ocean. And adaptation is a body, either a function or a body part that helps them to be most adapted to living in their habitat. And so to do this, I have a volunteer here with me in the house that is home from school as well. And he, we are going to dress him up as a seabird. So I wanna introduce you to Owen. So Owen, come on over here. All right. So I want all of you to think about some, uh, here's Owen, hi Owen. <laughs> so I want everybody to think about what are things that a seabird might need on their body to be best adapted for living on the ocean. I'd like you to type those in and Grace will share those with us. And I have some props here to, to demonstrate what that adaptation might be. And we're gonna turn Owen into a seabird, okay? Okay, great. So I've already got a lot of suggestions as to what um, adaptations seabirds have. So I'm gonna share with you that Sloan and Taylor and a variety of other people have all said feathers, that seabirds have feathers. Yes, yeah, so they have two layers of feathers. They have a layer of downy feathers close to their skin. So Owen's gonna get a down vest to signify that. And that's to help keep their skin dry. They're living on the ocean, they need to stay dry. They also have outer feathers that are waterproof and really stiff for being able to soar through the, the air as well as sometimes to dive underwater. So he's gonna get a, ra a yellow rain jacket that's waterproof to signify those feathers. So he's got some great feathers here. What else do we have? Okay, so Connor, Daniel, Grayson, Michael, and Sloan all say long wings. They have wings and, and uh, Jane, a lot of people are saying wings. Excellent, they absolutely have wings and you're gonna see later, seabirds come in all shapes and sizes and some have really long wings and some have really short wings. So, oh, there, you're just gonna put his wings out, awesome. And those are his wings, his arms. What else do we have? Okay, we have, um, we have a couple of people, Danny uh, is saying that they have webbed feet and yeah. claws on their feet. Absolutely, so they have webbed feet because they paddle along the surface of the water and sometimes some birds need those webbed feet for running along the surface of the ocean to take flight and go. So if you could fit that, that, that flipper on, he's got his webbed feet. Okay, what else do we have? Nice, Cameron, Cole, and Ellie, and a few others are all saying also that they have, um, that they have beaks. Yes, they do have beaks. And those beaks are really good for two things. They're really good for smelling, and they're also really good at eating their prey. So I have a special beak for Owen that we have. And there's a couple other things about the beak I wanna tell you about. So the beak not only is good at smelling and tearing apart food that they find, that's a great beak there, buddy. They also have a salt processing gland in their bill in their head that helps them remove salt from the water. And I have a skull here to show you what that looks like. This is an albatross skull. We're gonna be talking a lot about albatross later. And you can see that hooked beak that it has right there for tearing apart prey. But you can also see on the um, on the bill there, those two holes, and that's where the salt crystals come out. The salt gland is in here and the salt crystals come out there. So I'm gonna give Owen another prop for that. You get a salt shaker. That's to remind us of the salt processing gland. Okay, what else do we have? Okay, I have a few people here saying that they have a good sense of smell and good eyesight. Absolutely, a great sense of smell. They can smell from over 12 miles away, the albatrosses. So they can really smell their food and they also have Really good eyesight. And I've learned that some seabirds have really good eyesight adapted for 
seeing below the water and some of them have better eyesight for seeing just below the surface of the water. So it depends on the species. So we have some sunglasses for Owen to help him see um, on a sunny day. Awesome. <laughs> nice. And I have, I, I also have, um, some folks are saying that one of the uh, adaptations is migration. They're not quite sure um, what adaptation they have that allows them to migrate, but they think that there's something they use to migrate. Yeah, so they use their their nose to smell to help them migrate, but they also use an internal compass that helps them to sense the Earth's magnetic field. So I have a compass here for Owen. And they also use the stars and they can navigate by the stars. And so we have a star chart here to help Owen navigate uh, flying. So if the ocean is your home and the ocean is three quarters of our Earth's surface, that's a lot of navigation to do. They have an internal GPS to do all that. And I have one last little prop here, and that is a layer of insulation around their body, just a little bit of fat to keep that warm, warm thin. And I have a little wetsuit glove here um, for Owen. So does this look like a seabird you've ever seen before on the coast? Everybody give Owen a round of applause for being our seabird demonstration. Awesome! Owen looks like a great seabird, I have to say. If I saw you on the um, beach, Owen, I would definitely take a picture of you as a seabird. Yay. Well, thank you, Owen, for volunteering today on your school day. And I'm going to continue back with our group. And I will keep my eyes open for you at the beach. <laughs> so Jennifer, I just want to mention one other thing that Tom said that I thought was really great that we didn't say, but was worth mentioning. He mentioned that birds have light bones too. Oh, absolutely. Yes, they have very light bones. And some of them are kind of hollow and just have little struts inside for support. And that's to help them be able to fly really easily and efficiently. If they had heavy, thick bones, it would be really hard to and a lot of energy. So that, yes, that's a great adaptation to add as well. So I thought we could take some other questions right now before we move on. Absolutely. We have some great questions. And if you want to minimize your slides so we can just see you, that would be wonderful. I've been um, keeping track of these. So Juan is one of our regulars, and I love this question. So um, he asked, how did you get your job? <clears throat> well, that's a great question. So I started out when I was in college. I knew that I enjoyed teaching about nature and being outside. And I was very lucky I applied to work as a seasonal national park ranger. And I worked at Assateague Island National Seashore and Fire Island National Seashore as a ranger. And I got a lot of experience teaching there and talking to the public about those places. And then I went on and also taught environmental education at a couple schools. Um, and so I got all this experience teaching in different places. And then when I found out about the position with the sanctuary, I applied for it and I had an interview and eventually was hired. So it was uh, a great progression for experiences before landing with Noah. Great. And Connor and Daniel, as well as um, Ellen, are asking, what's what's your favorite part of what your job of your job? Oh, that's great. Well, I, you know what I really love is being super engaged with all the science and research that we're doing in the National Marine Sanctuaries and in the ocean here. And it keeps me learning all the time. And that's something that I really value is that I'm constantly learning. And that's something that feeds me every day and gives me a lot of excitement and energy is learning and being able to share these new learnings with, with everybody. So that's the part that I love the most. Great. Now we have a couple of seabird questions. So Raven is asking, what's the most common place where we might find seabirds? Well, most seabirds are actually out on the ocean. So sometimes if you go to the coast, you might see some birds that are hanging out on the beach or on the rocky shores. And those are shorebirds and they're really fun to watch and study as well. Seabirds are away from the coast. So they are a couple miles off the coast but the exception of gulls. And gulls come inland, and so if you live in the Great Lakes area or anywhere in the middle of the United States, there are a lot of gulls inland as well because they hang out near freshwater, but they also go near saltwater. So you might see some gulls as seabirds as well. Um, you might live near a bay, and if you live near a bay, you might see some seabirds. I've seen seabirds going across the Golden Gate Bridge, and they are hanging out in any open body of water. Great. We have um, a couple of other quick questions. 
So um, Sloan asks, what shape um, nest do the um, do seabirds make? Is there a specific shape to their nest? Well, it depends on the species. So some species of seabirds breed on the ice like penguins. And so they just make a little space on the ice for laying an egg. Some will actually go onto the rocky cliffs right offshore here. We have the Farallon Islands and we have the common myrrh that breeds on those islands with these rocky cliffs. And so they lay an egg that's kind of just tucked in right in those rocks that they can brood on. Um, some of them actually will make a little nest with some um, material that's on the ground and in for the albatrosses which we're going to be talking about more later they make a little divot in the sand and just bring a little grass around to kind of signify their nest so it really depends on the species there's and there's some that burrow underground and have their nest underground and they're really interesting to to learn about too Great. So I'm going to ask you one more question and then let you go on because I know you have some really interesting things to show us. But a lot of um, a lot of our attendees, a lot of the kids are asking about certain species, if they're a seabird or not. So I was hoping you could just um, tell them what distinguishes a seabird from the other birds, what makes something fall in that category, and also maybe just what the most common seabird is in your yeah, area. Common. Probably the most common would be a gull because we have a lot of different species of gulls around here in California. But a seabird is technically defined by an animal that makes its living from the ocean. So it eats its food from the ocean. So that's what makes a seabird a seabird. And the seabirds we're gonna focus on today are really birds that are offshore and we don't really get to see them from the beach. You have to get on a boat to see them. Um, so there's really different adaptations about them and how they navigate the world's ocean. Great. I'm going to I'm going to let you move on, but I'm just going to prep you that we are going to be asking you what your favorite seabird is oh at the end. God. Yeah. Or you can tell us now. <laughs> my favorite seabird is a uh, albatross. The black-footed and lace and albatrosses are my favorite. And I'll tell you why. When I first came to the sanctuary, I got to go out on a boat off into the Greater Farallon Sanctuary to learn more about the offshore ecosystems. And the naturalist on board who became a friend of mine, she, she said, oh, you're working at Cordell Bank. Do you know much about seabirds? And at the time I was like, well, a little bit. And she said, you're gonna learn a lot about seabirds. Have you ever seen an albatross? And um, I said, no. And she said, well, look there on the horizon. And there's pretty soon this bird with this lumbering, wing started coming directly towards us and I was completely dumbfounded by how amazingly graceful they were and just wanted to learn so much more about those birds and have since read books about them and learned more about how they have such amazing lifestyles. So they're my favorites and they're also some of the hardest to see and I think that's something I like in general are things that are kind of hard to see because I like to share them with people and help people see the things that are not easy to see through education. So awesome questions. I can't wait to hear some more of these. Let's move along to a little bit more about seabirds. So I wanted to just back up with another picture. We were talking about the salt gland and this is in the group of seabirds, the tube nose birds. And you can tell by the bill, this is a tube nose bird. It has like a tube down its bill. And you can see on top, of the bird on top here, this is a northern fulmar. It has a little area here, and that's where the salt gland, the salt crystals come out. The gland is here in their brain, and then on the albatross is here as well. But it's really inter interesting to see how it works. It's here in the brain, and it extracts the salt crystals, and they come out here this way. And sometimes you might see seabirds or gulls kind of shaking their head like this, and it might be to release some of the salt crystals out of those nostrils. So that's just a really cool thing I wanted to show you before we moved on. So the other neat thing about seabirds, they spend their entire lives at sea, except when they come to land to do one thing. And you have four choices here. I want you to type in what you think seabirds come to land to do. They either rest, eat, reproduce, or sleep. Which one? All right, great question. And, and I think I warned you that we have a very savvy crew that um, joins us. So I have to say that the overwhelming majority, Michael, Juliana, Ellie, uh, Dawn, Bridget, everyone is saying C, reproduce. Good job, you guys. You're right. They come to land to reproduce because birds can't lay an egg on the ocean. It would fall. They need it to be on land. 
So all around the world's ocean, seabirds find colonies where they can lay their eggs. Right here is a brown booby that's sitting on an egg right there. And some of them are closer to shore, some of them are farther away on remote islands um, to reproduce. So another neat thing about seabirds, I heard one of the adaptations I heard someone say is they have wings, they have long wings. And some seabirds have long wings. The wandering albatross has a wingspan of 12 feet, which is probably bigger than my car. I have a Subaru, which is amazing. And then if you look at this, this picture here, there's different colors of birds with different size wings. We have seabirds that are everywhere in between and all the way down to just like 12 inches across. And so the wingspan is a big part of determining how you use the ocean. Are you a wandering animal that wanders across the distance, the entire ocean, or are you an animal that stays sort of local and does a lot of quick movements and can and dive under the water? Some seabirds actually feed by diving under the water. And so you need some shorter wings for that. It would be a little hard with your long wings to swim under the water. So that's one of the neat things I like to pay attention to when looking at seabirds is watching their wings. And the short birds, the short wings, uh, short wing birds are usually a, a family of birds called the alcids. And those are the birds that are divers, they dive under the water. And then the mid birds are petrels as well as shearwaters. And then the albatrosses are those grand birds with the big wingspan, like the red there in this illustration. So it's all about your wing and your wing tells you how you're gonna use the ocean. So I wanna to move to our ambassador species here in the North Pacific because they really are, um, we call them an ambassador because they have a lot of stories to tell. These are predators. All seabirds are predators of the, of the prey in the ocean. And what happens to them is very indicative of the health of the ocean for all animals that live in the ocean. And so seabirds are truly ambassadors for us learning about the ocean's health. So on the left, we have the Laysan albatross or Moli, and then the black-footed albatross, the Kauku, and those are their native Hawaiian names. These are birds that breed in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So here's a map showing where those are. Some of you might be familiar with the main Hawaiian Islands here of Hawaii and Maui and Oahu, but further on, Northwest of there is this string of islands and atolls that are just a couple feet above sea level, uh, they're ancient coral reefs that have built up and become islands, and they are a breeding site for many types of seabirds, also sea turtles and monk seals, and it's a really special area for a lot of different marine life. This area is also protected by NOAA as the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. We're going to quiz you on how to say that later, and that is a partnership with the state of Hawaii as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA and they work together to help protect these places. So these seabirds, the albatrosses, breed out here, and some of them breed way out here in Curry Atoll and Midway Atoll. And someday I'd love to be able to visit there, but it's very hard to get there. You have to be a biologist and be willing to spend a lot of time in remote areas under really harsh conditions. So they come to these um, islands and they are in dense colonies. So this is Midway Island, and you can see there's some human history on this island. There was a battle of Midway out there. And so there were some remnants from some of the early military activity. And uh, the albatrosses don't care. This is a special place for them. They nest in these big, big colonies. And they have a lifelong pair bond. These birds take a couple of years that they kind of flirt with each other and they find their, their mate. And it's a lifelong pair bond if both birds can survive. These are black-footed albatross courting each other. And this is a laysan albatross courting each other. And they have really fun dances and sounds to make when they're doing this. And we have a little video to show you and you wanna have your volume up for this. So um, I think Grace is gonna run that video for us.
Awesome. Thank you for showing that video. They are so much fun to watch with the bill clacking and the dancing and the and the uh, wing movement. And they're just so much fun. And so they'll do that till they find their mate. And then they lay an egg after mating. And that egg is as big as a soda can. It's pretty big. And so having an egg that big takes a lot of energy. And so the parents take turns, what we call brooding, where they sit on that egg until it hatches. And then when it hatches out, you have a little baby albatross with these beautiful little downy feathers um, that they eventually will have replaced by adult feathers as they grow. So once you have that chick, there is a bit of work to do to feed that chick so that it can grow and get the energy it needs to become an adult albatross and take off and live on the ocean. So the parents at the beginning take turns one at a time heading out to sea to find food. And it's incredible how far they go. They go really far away from the Hawaiian Islands to get food. But you heard earlier that Coral Bank has a lot of food. And so some of them come all the way here to California to get food and then come back to their chicks. So when they come back to their chicks, the parent here looks to the, to the chick and the chick kind of taps at its bill like, feed me, feed me. And I don't want you to try this at home, but the adult albatross will regurgitate everything that it ate into that chick. And if you think about it, it's a lot of pressure to just line up just right. You can see how awkward it is with these bills to line up. And that bird's been gone for two weeks and it has all this food and makes the slurry oily mixture. And if the bird misses, then that chick misses all those nutrients. So it's a very intricate process that they've perfected over time in their adaptations. Um, I thought you might have some questions here, so we're gonna take a quick break for questions before we move on. Okay, great. I've been keeping track of all the questions and we've got a few. Um, so Beckett's wondering, how do um, seabirds protect their eyes when they dive? That's a good question. Um, I'm not 100% sure myself. I know some birds have a membrane that folds down over their eye to protect their eyes diving underwater. I'm not sure. Albatrosses spend most of their time on top of the water and they'll put their heads underwater and, and maybe dip down a little bit. So I don't know if they have um, a membrane or not. That's something good to look up to find out. But some birds do have that. They have a whole membrane that closes over their eye. So that would be good to find out. Great. Um, Daniel's wondering at what age they start migrating or, or flying further distances. Well, from the very first age, uh, first time they fly off their islands that they were born on, they take off for the open ocean and they might be gone for a couple of years before they come back to start breeding. I think that albatrosses start breeding around age six. So they might be gone a couple of years, but they always come back to the islands that they were born on and to the general colony area that they were born in. So they have an amazing ability to navigate the world ocean to find their way home. Now here's an interesting question from Dawn. How do the seabirds know if the chick is theirs when they come back and there are all these chicks on the beach? Well, I think it's predominantly about sound and the, the chicks and the parents start communicating right away as soon as they, that chick is hatched out. And so predominantly by sound, and also the parent has the navigation to come right back to the same colony. There might be some other factors involved there as well, and, and some of them might be mysteries, and I'm sure there could be some mistakes along the way, but based on survival and adaptations, it's best for um, the communication for that parent to come back to their chick. So that's the predominant um, communication. I think it's predominantly sound, but that's another good thing to look up. Are there other ways that that chick and parent get aligned back together? But I'm pretty, it's pretty sure it's sound. Great. And there are a lot of people, I was going to hold this question, but a lot of people are asking it. Nate's asking it and um, Gargi's asking it. How long does an albatross live? Like what's the average lifespan? Well, we don't know the average lifespan, but one thing we are learning is um, through banding studies. And I was going to save this for the very end, but I'll start, I'll introduce it now. We know that oldest albatross alive is 69 years old, and it's a laysan albatross. And we know that through banding, which is putting an aluminum band around their, around their foot. You can see right here, there's that beautiful webbed foot, but they put a little band here. This one might be banded here, I can't tell. 
And then when they come back, the biologists on the island will go to see which birds are back and then they can track this over time. So one bird has been tracked at coming back, is, has been tracked since she was a baby and she is 69 years old and her name is Wisdom. She is a famous albatross. She even has her own Facebook page and she is an amazing bird that has lived 69 years and get this, she is a female and she is still laying eggs. In fact, she's probably getting ready to say goodbye to her chick for the year um, out on Midway Island right now. So we know that albatrosses live at least 69 years old, maybe longer. Smaller seabirds, they don't live as long, but these bigger birds have a longer lifespan. Great, I'm gonna ask you one more question before I um, let you move on. And that is um, a really interesting question that came in from Dylan. How do they sleep? So I think he's um, asking when they're out at sea and they're spending so much time, how and where do they sleep? Well, they have the ability to rest part of their brain, sort of like marine mammals do, and they can just keep flying. And they're able to kind of rest part of their brain while flying. So they sort of sleep while they're flying. The actual mechanics of that, I'm not too, too sure, but I do know that they can rest their brain and, and somewhat turn it off but, and kind of go on autopilot for a while while they're soaring across the ocean. Great, I know you have a lot of really fun stuff to continue to show us, so I'm gonna let you go on, Jennifer, but I'll track the questions. I love these great questions, and you know what, questions are awesome, and the internet can really help. Um, so now that you have these questions about these birds, it'll be really fun for you to do some research to learn more about these amazing birds. So when those albatrosses head out to sea, they're looking for food, and this is a typical albatross food chain, and it all starts with microscopic plants, these phytoplankton. And these phytoplankton are in areas where there's a lot of cool uh, oceanographic processes called upwelling, which is where nutrients come up to the surface and really fertilize the food web. And so they become um, phytoplankton, take all those nutrients and grow. And then when you have all these phytoplankton, all the zooplankton, which are animals, tiny little microscopic animal plankton, and they just float along, those also will explode in population because they like to eat the phytoplankton. And then it goes on and on up the food web, small fish and many different animals feed on that zooplankton and then squid feed on those small fish. And then wherever you have squid, you have seabirds like albatrosses. So the albatrosses are heading to areas in the ocean that have a lot of this phytoplankton because they know that's where they're gonna get the food that they want. And so where do they go? Well, here is a map. This, this was produced by a group of researchers, a group uh, called Oikonos Ecosystem Knowledge. They're based in Hawaii and they work with scientists at Hawaii Pacific University and the United States Geological Survey and other partners to do a study to learn about where do the birds go. And it's kind of hard. You can't really have a boat on the ocean following an albatross. So they actually do this with telemetry and they put a tag on the bird and then they can study the data points that come in. I'm gonna show you that in a second. But this is a map showing some of the areas that albatrosses will visit. And when they're being tagged from their breeding site, so Curry Atoll here in Turn Island, that's where they're breeding. This means they're coming back. They're going out to sea and they're coming back because they have a chick there. Um, and so those show you some of the incredible migrations that, well, not really migrations, but some of the feeding foraging trips they will do to feed their chick. So here at Turn Island, there are a couple birds that flew all the way across the Pacific Ocean, about 2,500 miles to Cordell Bank to get squid and then fly back. So that's like 5,000 miles round trip. That's like going across the United States twice. And they'll do that in about two weeks. Um, so this is pretty amazing that we have this science that can show us where these birds are going so we can learn more about what activities are happening in the waters that these birds are going to. So this is how we know. Through science, scientists are able to use the satellite tracking with the satellite tag. And it's a very light tag. They just tape it onto the outer feathers of the bird and the bird doesn't even know it's there. And that little satellite tip here sends a signal to a satellite, which then sends a signal to our computer and then we're able to start making maps of where these animals go. There are also satellite tags that are put on marine mammals like whales or dolphins 
and all whales and dolphins eventually come up to the surface to breathe air. And so when it does, it can send a ping to the satellite that has to transmit through air to send a location. So this is a really fascinating way to study the ocean is by using these transmitters. And I'm imagining you might have some questions about this. So let's take a quick pause for some questions. So we have an interesting question from Sloan, who must have seen one of our previous webinars we had on sail drones. So Sloan is wondering if you can use a sail drone or a drone to study seabirds? You know, I don't know. I, I'm maybe with cameras, but one of the things that is hard about seabirds is they move really fast. Um, albatrosses can travel up to 80 miles an hour when they're crossing the ocean. So a sail drone might, unless it was following along it, um, that would be pretty tough. But there might be ways if there were um, different telemetry uh, attachments to that sail drone that could could track maybe fine scale movements of it every day uh, throughout the day, like how close an albatross is. I think sail drones have been predominantly for ocean conditions and air conditions um, out at sea, but I don't know about animals. So it's tough, they're moving pretty quickly and they're going pretty far distances. So I think you have to have a bigger picture um, for tracking them across the ocean. Great, I love it when we get those questions that cross webinars when um, kids are making connections. So Duncan asks, do the tags affect the birds? And Connor and Daniel are also wondering then how long the tags last. Absolutely. So. One of the neat things about science is they test these things to make sure that they're going to have as no, little to no impact on the animal, because otherwise they're not going to be learning that much if they're impacting the animal. They want the animal to be living its natural life and these tags to somewhat be like a little spy on their back. And so they're super, super light and they've been shown to show no impact on the bird's lifestyle in terms of flying or feeding. And birds are have feathers and feathers eventually get degraded and old and they will molt feathers, which means they release some feathers a couple at a time and eventually are replaced by newer ones. So that tag will fall off um, at some point. Most of these tags are designed to, to go for about 85 to 90 days and then they fall off. And it might sound kind of sad in the sense that it's going to fall into the ocean, but the amount of information that we learn about these birds and how, and how that's helpful for helping conserve them is a far greater benefit than losing the tag to the ocean. I know that's a concern of a lot of people, and it is for me too, but we have to think about the science and how much more um, we can learn by doing studies like this. Some tags can be taken right off. If a bird's coming right back to its nesting site, they can take the tag off. Some of the other animals, they can retrieve the tag from. Some tags on some other animals are designed to pop off at a certain time, and then the researcher has to go to the area and collect the tag. So it's kind of interesting and amazing technology for learning about the ocean. Great. We have um, another interesting question, and that's how do you catch the birds to put the tags on them? Well, when they're at the breeding site, the albatrosses, they call them goonie birds because they're not so great on land, but they are well designed for life on the ocean. And so when they're on land, they try to approach them very carefully without disturbing them too much, and they'll grab them from behind and hold the wings down. And usually they'll put something on its eyes to um, calm the bird so it doesn't get overly stimulated with the visual cues of what's happening. When they tag out at sea, so uh, years ago, the scientists with Oikonos Ecosystem Knowledge, they came and tagged birds at Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary and they had to attract the bird, they got a permit to do this, um, attract the bird with squid and bring that, boat, that bird really close to the boat and then they would use a giant net to scoop the bird up and again, hold it close, calm it, take that uh, tag on, and then they let it go. So that's the process of how they tag them. Great, there are st um, a few more questions, but I'm gonna let you go on because I wanna hear, uh, I know you have some more interesting things to share with us, so carry on. All right, let's keep going. <clears throat> so, after the parents have come, they've regurgitated the chicks a couple times and they've brought them this slurry of, of squid oil from the squid they've eaten. But squid have one hard part on their body. They're predominantly a soft-bodied animal, but there's one hard part on their body and that's the beak. 
and the beak is is kind of made out of the same material our fingernails are made out of and so it doesn't digest um, so the bird gets filled up with these squid beaks. They also get filled up with other things like seeds or little pieces of wood or feathers that they might have been picking at around their nest. But they also are showing that they are getting filled up also with human trash and plastic. And that's telling us that the parents are eating plastic out at sea and feeding it to the chicks. And that's a real concern. And the way we know this is that the chicks will regurgitate, they throw up. There's a lot of throwing up with seabirds. It's, it's a, not the most glamorous um, science to study because there's so much throwing up, but they will regurgitate what we call a bolus. And this is stuff that they can't digest. So like an owl regurgitates a pellet of fur and bones, an albatross and, and some other seabirds regurgitate the stuff that they can't digest. And so this is, an, this is a pile of evidence of data to, to study, to understand what these birds are eating out at sea and what they're being fed. And uh, the biologists that are on the islands are seeing trash in every single bolus of these birds. And so that is a real concern. Like I was saying, a winged ambassador, they're telling us of concerns of what's happening on the ocean. And this is definitely one of them they are eating plastic. So this is basically a, a record of the chick's diet. And scientists will actually study that in the lab. They will weigh how many squid beaks and how many pieces of plastic so they can quantify how much, what percentage of prey uh, was plastic and what percentage was natural. Here is a picture of an, a bolus that's been regurgitated by a chick that's been picked apart and spread out so you can see it really well. And this specific bolus has quite a few pieces of large trash, large pieces of plastic in it. You might see a reflector here. I see a pen cap here. And this looks like a, a wheel from a toy. And then you have some other things that are kind of hard to describe because they're just pieces and fragments. Um, plastic degrades out in the sun and in the salt and it just breaks down to smaller and smaller pieces all the way to microscopic pieces, which means it still exists, it's just microscopic. But the birds, they think, might be picking at this plastic and eating it because it might smell like prey to them. Um, anything floating in the ocean can start to pick up um, plankton, like diatoms, and diatoms are a type of phytoplankton, and they'll attach themselves to that plastic, and that puts off a smell that the birds might want to then eat. So they might eat it by accident, the other thing is that when we have things floating in the ocean, that we call it flotsam, there are fish eggs and all sorts of interesting critters that attach to flotsam as part of their ecosystem. And so there might be fish eggs and things attached to the, these pieces of plastic that the albatrosses are going after. Either way, we just know it's a problem and it's really sad to see these beautiful birds being impacted by this plastic. So where does it all come from? And this is a part where we really have an opportunity to help support improving the health of the ocean and helping seabirds because it all comes from land. So we have the ocean that takes up three quarters of the Earth's surface and the rest of it land. And the ocean is downstream from everywhere all around the planet. And so when there is plastic or trash on the ground that's not picked up and disposed of, eventually, it will make it down to a creek or a stream or a storm drain or a river and then out to the ocean. And then the ocean carries it along the currents and in some areas it congregates really densely. There's certain gyres in the ocean that spin and kind of concentrate things in the middle. And we're finding that trash is growing in the ocean and plastic is growing in the ocean and the seabirds are telling us this is not good. This is not a good thing. But this is a really amazing opportunity for all of us to figure out solutions. And there's so many people working on how do we cut this? And I know that you all probably have a ton of ideas about how can we prevent this? How can we prevent this trash getting into the ocean? And I wanna hear your ideas. This is an opportunity to type in, what are your ideas for how do we prevent trash and plastic from making it to the ocean? Okay, like I said, we have a pretty savvy group here. So what are your ideas for how we can um, prevent these plastics and this trash from getting into the ocean? Dylan says we should recycle. Uh, I see someone says to reuse. Kyle says beach cleanups. Rebecca says spread the word. Um, Duncan says recycle more. 
Duncan also says to compost. Rebecca says if we pick up our trash, Chris is saying the same thing. So um, sometimes if you do it safely with an adult, you might be able to go out and do like a beach cleanup or clean up your neighborhood. Ellie says you can even make a sign for the beach. Uh, Lisa says you can clean up in your neighborhood because if you live near the ocean, your trash might end up in the ocean. And Tom suggests going on trash walks. So I think we've gotten a lot of great ideas. Those are great ideas. And those are all things that every single one of you can be part of, especially if you do it with a lot of other people. So getting your friends together, getting your school together, getting your whole community together to be part of those actions is much more effective than just one person. So those are great and definitely get your friends engaged. Um, a couple things that we do in our family, we've been trying to figure out ways to cut out plastic because it's pretty hard. But uh, one of the things I have is this little uh, kit of serviceware. So if I happen to be out and about and needing a fork, I got my fork, I got chopsticks, I even have a straw. And you know, at first it was like, I would forget it, but now it's just a habit and this is what I have. And I have ne had never had to pick up any utensils out and about. The other thing is of course, using reusable bags. I know right now we're in a really weird time and this is not being encouraged, but this is another great thing we can use to prevent single use plastic bags. Um, also our water bottles and coffee cups, things like that, they really add up. If we're able to reduce those things by having our own, um, that is a huge thing. And not only that, you are being an example to everybody else that this is important to do. And that's something I notice um, when I'm doing it. I feel really good that I'm showing this as an example. This is what we should be doing. The other thing is getting people involved in helping to make change at the larger level and writing letters to our uh, communities as well as our legislators and the government about we need to find solutions for preventing plastic pollution and creating things that are reusable and recyclable much more easier. So it takes multiple actions. You guys are on the right track and I hope that these are all things you do and I wanna encourage specifically to be really safe about it, um, being really safe when you're picking up trash, um, especially right now since we're in such a, a bizarre time. But these are all great things we can do on land to help protect seabirds but also other types of animals in the ocean from everything from the tiny microscopic plankton to the great whales, keeping plastic and trash out of the ocean is one of the number one things every single one of you can be part of that solution on. And I wanna end with just another story. We talked about wisdom a little bit earlier, but I wanna just end with her because we're hearing about these challenges that we're having. Wisdom, the albatross, she is a survivor. And she is 69 years old, as you heard, and she is still coming back to Midway Island and breeding and laying eggs with her chick, um, with her mate. And she did breed this year and it's May. So she's pro her chick's probably getting ready to set sail and become an adult albatross. And if you think about the ch some of the challenges we have on the ocean right now, She's made it through with all these things. And so there's some incredible adaptations she has that she's passing on to her young as she makes chicks. And so she's truly a symbol of hope and resilience. And again, as an ambassador, we can be helping to support that. She sends us a message of her, to you, helping to help keep plastic out of the ocean. And I hope that you'll consider what things you can do from here on out to help wisdom and all her family members out on the ocean. Um, I want to share one little story as I'm wearing my albatross band here. Um, pretty hard to, well, let's see, do this right here. This is my albatross band and it was actually a gift for my husband because he knows I love albatrosses, but banding is a big part of the story for helping protect albatrosses and learn about them. And so this was a fundraiser for a group that is helping to support the funding for banding and learning about birds like wisdom. And um, I always wear this as a remembrance to remember that we can, we can do hard things and we can help do better by um, continuing to help protect animals and learn about them. And it helps me remember to keep sharing that story as well. But I wanna just take this opportunity to, to answer any last questions that you might have. And thank you so much for your really good questions. And I wanna encourage you to please Spend some time learning more about seabirds in your area and also learning about wisdom. She has a Facebook page and uh, she's an amazing animal.
Great. Well, we do have a few questions. I'm going to uh, save. Uh, well, actually, so we have a few questions, and I'm going to ask what I think is a really fun one. Taylor asks, what's the weirdest thing you have learned in st when, while studying seabirds? <laughs> what's the weirdest thing? Well, I think the regurgitation is kind of weird. It's a cool adaptation, and I think it's, a, and that's what I love about it. There's so many fascinating things about seabirds, and the fact that they regurgitate to their chicks is it's kind of weird. Um, I also think that the treasure trove of information that they have in their boluses is really neat because there's so much we can learn about the health of the ocean by studying the diet, and they are giving us a perfect data sample to be able to learn about. So a little weird, but kind of cool. So I'm glad you mentioned that, and I just want to um, also highlight the fact that if you go to the NOAA Live website, we have a virtual bolus dissection activity there that you can do. Um, there is also, if anyone wants to email me, again, I'm um, one of your moderators, I'm Grace Simpkins. I also have an activity on how you can kind of make your own bolus and then dissect it. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about the bolus, I encourage you to do that. Unfortunately, we're out of time because there are some um, really great questions that are still coming in. But what I want to do is I want to highlight a few of the things that Jennifer talked on. She talked about that national monument in Hawaii. We are going to Hawaii next week with our NOAA Live series. So we'll be hearing someone from the monument talking to us on Monday. She also mentioned using satellite technology. One of our early talks with Kara Wilson was about satellite technology. You can take a look at that webinar. Um, she also, I'm trying to think, uh, talked about, um, we talked about the sail drones. Someone asked a sail drone question. So you can look through some of our previous webinars if, if something Jennifer said piqued your interest. And the video that she played that showed the clacking and the dancing, which was really fun, is also on the website if you want to take a look at it and see it. It's a little bit longer. You can see it in its entirety. But I want to thank you all for coming to the webinar. Thank you, Jennifer. It was so amazing. I studied seabirds in grad school, so I have to say that I was very excited to have our seabird uh, expert on our series. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise. On Friday, we're going to hear all about tornadoes. So I encourage you to tune in if you want to learn more about tornadoes. And uh, yeah, just really excited. Have a great day. We'll see you Friday. And thanks for all your help and your assistance, Jennifer. No problem. Thanks, everybody. Keep learning. Take care. See ya.